Good morning, guys. We're about at the noon hour. Thanks for coming, uh, as usual. And uh, it's kind of fun to see so many familiar faces that come every week. So hopefully, we really start to appreciate the forest and not just the trees. I mean, the trees and the forest, or whatever the metaphor, just to go with it. So today, we're going to talk about pharmacokinetics, something near and dear to my heart. That's what my degree is in. So uh, we are very fortunate that we have uh, Ed Acosta here on campus. He really knows the ins and outs of pharmacokinetics and can also explain it. So that's a double whammy plus. Um, so for those of you online, also thanks for, for joining. We have muted you as usual, but feel free to put something in the chat box if you have a question. And then towards the end of the seminar, I'll check in the chat box uh, if there are any. Um, I'll just keep this short and sweet. So Ed, it's all yours. Thanks, Mike. I always appreciate the opportunity to come back. Good afternoon to everyone. Uh, really good attendance today. It's great to have everybody here. Uh, as Mike mentioned, I, uh, I've been doing, I've been here for you know, years and um, quite a while doing the pharmacokinetics, pharmacodynamics, um, small molecule assay development. In fact, I brought my major, my mass spec guys right there, uh, Kevin, uh, in case there's any specific questions on mass spectrometry. Um, but we just just one time here. Ignore it. <laughs> we develop uh, uh, these these assays uh, to quantitate uh, small molecules. Most of what we do is in the antiviral realm uh, of drugs, but also uh, oncology, as well as quite a few other uh, disease areas that that we touch on. Most of what we do is clinical. So we get samples shipped to us uh, from really from around the world uh, for multi center clinical. Clinical trials, international clinical trials, and we analyze the data and uh, get back with protocol teams, etc. Um, uh, and, and a lot of what we do, especially now, is also uh, registrational work. So we've had multiple audits by the FDA here and our lab at UAB, and uh, luckily they've all gone well so far. Um, but there will be more in the, in the future. But this is a lot. The pharmacokinetics is a lot of what we do. Um, in both in pediatrics and in adults. And of course, if you have any questions as we go through, just uh, just feel free to let me know. Um, so as you all are aware, finding a new drug really is a crapshoot. It takes quite a few years just for the discovery of the compound. I'm not really involved with that area, with, with discovery, but really when we get to phase zero, phase one, uh, on through phase four. Um, after FDA uh, review and approval, this can take up to 10, 12, 14 years. The fastest one I've ever seen was an antiretroviral drug for HIV was developed and approved within four years um, because it was fast tracked, et cetera. So it can go quicker uh, if there's a need uh, for it. But from uh, thousands of compounds screened uh, over that time frame, only one or maybe two uh, will be approved by the FDA. Uh, there are many different facets to uh, uh, the drug development process. I focus a lot more on uh, closer to phase one and phase two uh, arenas, which are the single ascending dose, multiple ascending dose, looking at different formulations of the drug. Most of the companies, when they have a new product, they're, they're going through these different phases, um, whether it's adults or pediatrics, they're always coming up with new, new and improved uh, formulations for their drug. So one of the ones we had, we were dealing with four separate formulations with different pharmacokinetic profiles of each one. And we said, all right, come on, pick one and let that move forward so we can get something done. We have to look at food effects, uh, the bio, relative bioavailability, and of course, add me the absorption, distribution, metabolism, uh, and excretion of the drugs. Moving more into phase two, at least for traditional drugs, is the dose finding aspect in the intended population uh, that's, that the drug is to be used in. And then we start looking at the drug drug interactions uh, as well as other uh, uh, components. And phase three is the much larger clinical trials. Uh, let's we'll start looking at special populations, um, but also um, this is where the population pharmacokinetic analyses, so a lot of, uh, a few samples from a lot of different patients uh, enrolled in the phase three, uh, phase three studies. So all this comes together for the, uh, uh, the eventual submission. We're working on one of these right now. I'll show you the drug uh, at the end. Um, so some of the pharmacokinetic causes of drug failure, I think by far uh, the biggest one is the poor bioavailability of the drug due to low aqueous uh, solubility or high first pass metabolism. Uh, another important one is simply too short of a half-life. Uh, if you give a drug to a, well, 
if you give a drug to a mouse and it's disappeared in about 14 seconds, probably not long enough of a half-life to, to cause any, uh, any effect. Same thing with humans. Um, if the drug has a really quick half-life, especially these days, the last thing people want to do is have to take the drug five, six, eight times a day <coughs> just to keep the concentrations up. So the half-life is a critical component uh, to, the, to the drugs and the dosing interval for the drugs. And then also unanticipated drug interactions. These will all more often be revealed in, um, in phase two uh, or in some, and also phase three studies that can result in highly variable pharmacokinetic characteristics uh, and undesirable effects on the safety uh, and the efficacy uh, of the drug. One of the companies many years ago with an HIV drug, antiretroviral, had developed this drug, looked great, they were moving forward, jumped right into phase three trials, did a huge, I don't know, hundreds and hundreds of patients phase three trial, got done, got all, this, all the data back, and the drug basically had no effect. And they couldn't figure out why. Well, because they were allowing the patients to take another drug that chewed the meta increased the metabolism and eliminated their drug. And so in the end, they wasted an entire phase three trial because they didn't properly look at uh, the uh, drug-drug interactions uh, before moving, uh, moving into it. So some of the reasons for attrition, at least from 1990 to 2000, pharmacokinetics used to be a, a, a big and bioavailability of a very large component of why a drug would not make it. That has decreased recently. Uh, most companies these days will have not just one, but two, three, four, maybe up to five drugs <clears throat> as backups if the, if the one they choose for whatever reason doesn't work. And so <clears throat> typically in phase one, but mostly in phase two, and I'll touch on this a little bit later on as well, is where a no-go no -go decision can be made with a particular drug based on the pharmacodynamics if the study's done properly, designed properly. Um, and then they can move on to uh, step two uh, or a different drug. So just as a review, pharmacokinetics is the, the time course of a drug uh, in the body. It's what the body does to the drug, how it's metabolized, how it's cleared. And pharmacodynamics, then, is the relationship between the dose. I like to use the concentration, not the dose, um, of the drug in the body and the measured effects. So in other words, what the drug does to the body. Measured effects can be beneficial clinical effects or toxicities uh, as well. ADME is usually what we focus on, the uh, absorption, distribution, metabolism, and excretion. Uh, all of these uh, components uh, uh, come into play. We look at this mostly from uh, what we call a non-compartmental pharmacokinetic analysis perspective, where we just we derive. Uh, most of you are probably somewhat familiar with uh, deriving a concentration time curve of a drug. It could be in animals, it could be in humans, but multiple samples are collected following a given dose, and all that information is put together. And by analyzing it, and I'll touch on that in a little bit here as well, is where we get the various. Uh, critical pharmacokinetic parameters that we need. And uh, if I don't mention it later on, somebody remind me that um, which of the parameters are, 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 are critical and why. Um, and and I'll, I'll try to remember to, to touch on that as well. But so the absorption, distribution, metabolism, and excretion of the drug, all these components uh, uh, come together in pharmacokinetic analyses. So why is this PK thing even close to being important? It's pretty boring. <laughs> Can be, yes, at times. Uh, other times, it's kind of interesting. Um, but the ultimate aim of the drug therapy is, is to achieve an optimal efficacy uh, while avoiding toxicity. And that's simply what this graph here shows, where um, uh, these, these, this top curve, these are all dose. Each of these arrows down here is a dose. This is actually a simulation of a real drug called Efavirenz. It has about a 24-hour or so half-life, once daily dosing uh, of the drug. And I just simulated it with a high clearance, middle clearance, and a low clearance of the drug to get these uh, to get these curves. But at some point, the concentrations will be too toxic. There's a, every single drug has a toxicity threshold. Every single one. I don't care what it is or what it's for. <coughs> the majority of the time, we just don't find it. Similarly, every drug has a minimum concentration that is needed. Again, we just don't usually don't find it. And so the goal is to find a wide enough therapeutic window where that doesn't really matter. As long as the drug concentrations are somewhere in that window, um, it's efficacious uh, and there's minimal uh, toxicity. 
And that's really the goal. What I like to try to do in, in the work, my, my research is define what this window is clinically. Uh, it's very, very difficult to do. Um, but, a question. Oh, I'm sorry. When you're generating this window, does that have to be like normalized to the patient's weight or anything like that so that create a more accurate window? Or? It depends on the drug. Uh, so some drugs, their clearance or distribution volume is um, relying on body weight. And so, especially in pediatric, it's a huge issue. We almost always have to take into account weight, sometimes age. It's really little babies, uh, creatinine, clearance of serum creatinine, et cetera. Generally in adults, even though there can be a wide range of weights, everybody's usually big enough where the weight isn't as big of a factor. Um, but yes, we, that's something that we, that we always be taking a look at. But if weight does not bear out as a covariate that influences the clearance of the drug, then there's no point in using it. So, but yeah, so we, so we try to look at this window and especially in the field of antiviral drugs where I, where I mostly focus, um, you've got, you know, viral susceptibility to the drugs, clinical susceptibility, resistance mutations, et cetera, things that can come up that can vary this window. Uh, uh, and luckily for us, most of the toxicities are pretty minimal and, and the, the therapeutic window is relatively wide. So the absorption process, movement of drug molecules across the biological barriers from the site of administration to the blood, obviously uh, many different routes of administration, oral, parenteral, IV, sub-Q, IM, other uh, inhalation, uh, rectal, topical, transdermal. Uh, we had done a, been part of a large transdermal study um, in pigs. What kind of pigs were those? Uh, Do you remember? I forgot. They were medium, big pigs. And um, the, the data just came to us, and, and so we had to and following transdermal administration of the drug. And then bioavailability, the fraction of the drug that reaches the systemic circulation. But the bioavailability does not dictate the rate of drug absorption. It's how much goes in versus how much gets systemically uh, available. So you give 1,000 milligrams, but if you only, only can measure half of it, it's about 50% bioavailable. Um, first pass metabolism, especially for drugs that are hepatically metabolized, CYP3A4 enzymes, et cetera, uh, can be a huge uh, issue uh, depending on the drug, but it's the, uh, the blood supply of the upper GI tract passes through the liver uh, before reaching the systemic circulation and it can suck drug out. Drugs can also be metabolized, particularly 3A4, and influenced by uh, proteins like uh, PGP, p glycoprotein, uh, in the gut wall. Uh, as well as the liver. So this drug down here, this, this sequinavir SQV, is, is a really old antiretroviral protease inhibitor drug. This thing had, it was needed at the time. Today, there not only is any way it would even get approved, but at the time it had 4% bioavailability. So patients were taking handfuls of pills and 4% bioavailability. So then they reformulated it and got it up to 8%. <laughs> so that was really cool. Mm -hmm. um, and so what happened was the drug is extremely uh, metabolized very rapidly by uh, CYP3A4. So then this other little drug from Abbott comes around called Ritonavir, RTV. Probably to this day still one of the most potent cytochrome P450 3A4 inhibitors known to humans. Very, very, very potent inhibitor of 3A4. It does other stuff too, and it tastes awful. Mm -hmm. um, but you give a little bit of the ritonavir with a full dose of the sequinavir, and that sequinavir area into the curve increases by 28 times. So sequinavir in and of itself never went very far, but in combination with ritonavir, it's a very popular combination for a number of years uh, for the treatment of, uh, of HIV infection because of that change in the bioavailability due to the low-dose ritonavir. So pH and drug absorption, this is something that a lot of people, ah, you know, this is boring. It is, but it's also very critical. Uh, we, we, we deal with this all the time, especially in pediatrics. When new formulations are developed, little babies can't swallow a horse pill, right? You gotta have some kind of a liquid, a suspension, uh, something, uh, one of the solvents, uh, dispersible tablets. Uh, oftentimes it needs, it needs to be mixed up in breast milk or other formula or something that can be given to the babies. And these different formulations um, will affect the dis dissolution rate uh, uh, and sometimes the, the degree of the absorption uh, of the drug. 
And so, and the PKA has a, plays a, a, a big role. So the typical gut is, has a pH of one to two-ish, right, range. Now, if you eat, that pH is gonna go up to four or five-ish range for a period of time while the food is still in the summer. So that's a big change in the pH. Now, if you've got a drug with a PKA that um, is eight or nine, um, so on, on, the, on the weekly basic side, and the gut pH on an empty stomach is one or two, you're gonna have a lot of ionized drug that's not gonna be available for absorption because the closer the pH and the pKa are, uh, the more unionized drug and the better the absorption. That's really all that this slide uh, is saying. In little babies, it's very different because why? They're always being fed. <laughs> they, they don't go eight hours or 10 hours like adults might need to do that. I don't scream a kid on your hands. And so they're being fed every two, three, four hours. And so if, if doses of the drug are given to that baby, um, Oftentimes you have to be concerned about, is it around the feeding time or not? And most people just don't think like that. Unfortunately, someone like me does. Um, protein binding is also, a, 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 can be a critical component. Uh, drugs are transported as unbound um, and or partly reversibly bound to blood components. Only the free drug is the active drug. So a lot of the drugs we deal with are 99.8, 99.9% protein bound, but there's enough free drug there still to, uh, to, to cause the uh, therapeutic effect. And two factors determine the degree of protein binding, the affinity uh, of the drug for the protein, and then the number of binding sites uh, available. Typically, not always, but in general, acidic drugs bind more to albumin and basic drugs bind more to AAG or uh, alpha-1 acid glycoprotein. So the distribution volume, this is a, it's a theoretical volume that would be required in the body to contain the administered dose if that dose was completely evenly distributed uh, at the concentration measured in plasma. So that, um, uh, well, I'm going to do this first. So typically a drug with it, because we measure drugs generally in plasma serum, and it's always a unit of, of uh, milligrams or micrograms and nanograms per unit volume. Nanograms per mil, milligrams per liter. That liter part, that milliliter part, that's the volume component. And that's what, why the distribution volume of the drug is, is critical when we're dealing with the concentrations. But in general, drugs with a low distribution volume are in the three to five liter range. These are drugs that typically only stay in the plasma. They don't go all over the body. Medium, uh, they do distribute in some of the extracellular space. Then high distribution volume drugs uh, generally go into tissue, fat, brain, liver, kidneys, wherever else uh, that particular compound wants to go. And so some of these distribu distribution volumes can be quite large. That sequinegar drug I had mentioned earlier actually has a distribution volume of three, 320 liters. So not even I could handle 320 <laughs> liters. And so, um, so that drug clearly gets everywhere in the body. It's very highly protein bound and gives it an apparent distribution volume that's super high. And that's why the distribution volume for oral drugs is called an apparent distribution volume. Um, because it looks like it has to be that high to accommodate the concentrations that we're seeing. Um, and so, so distribution volume is important. And then elimination of the drug, obviously we have uh, metabolism uh, and excretion. So elimination is simply the irreversible loss of the drug from the site of measurement. Metabolism is conversion from one chemical species to another. Um, obviously the goal of metabolism is to, to take a compound, whether it's a drug or a, some chemical or something, that is of a nonpolar uh, species uh, to a more polar species. And that polar species can then be uh, more readily eliminated uh, through the urine. And then excretion is the irreversible loss of the chemically uh, unchanged drug. And so these are all the com uh, components of pharmacokinetics that we take into consideration uh, when looking at a drug. Sometimes for drugs, the excretion is not important. It's always important, but it's not as critical. So a drug that's almost completely hepatically metabolized by CYP3A4. It has no active metabolites. Excretion really isn't that important, right? Because the, the urinary clearance of the drug just doesn't really matter that much. 
Um, now, if it has active metabolites that are excreted in the urine, that's a different story. And in that case, we'd want to maybe take that into consideration depending on what the study is. So just very briefly for metabolism, the enzymes involved in, in metabolism are, are present in many uh, uh, tissues, uh, including the gut. Um, and the overall, overall goal, as I mentioned, is to produce more polar compounds that can be uh, renally eliminated. And drug metabolism rates vary tremendously uh, across patients. For some of the drugs, depending on how they're metabolized, CYP2D6, et cetera, there can be genetic factors that will influence um, uh, uh, the area under the curve or the, the resulting concentrations of the drug, coexisting disorders. Um, so in some of the little baby studies that we've done, and especially in premature babies, um, the slightest change in their serum creatinine will double the area of the, area of the curve of the drug. I mean, just really a small change in serum creatinine just because their uh, kidney isn't working normal at that time. And so the, a lot of variability uh, can be seen. And then, of course, drug-drug interactions. Uh, especially those involving uh, induction of the cytochrome P450 system or inhibition uh, of that system, such as the case with Latonavir earlier, which basically shut, not completely, but almost completely shuts down 3A4 uh, metabolism. So some of the, just, I'm just very briefly going to touch on this because I want to get to the other slides. Um, so phase one metabolism uh, in, uh, involved formation of newer modified functional groups through oxidation reduction or hydrolysis. This is where the, the P450 uh, enzyme system comes in, multiple different families. 3A4 is by far the most common, uh, but others are involved as well. And these enzymes can be induced or inhibited by many different drugs and, and other substances. <coughs> And so all that needs to be taken into consideration, especially when we reach the clinical phase. So a big part of what time we spend in phase two and sometimes in phase three studies is figuring out the exclusion criteria or inclusion criteria for some of these studies. It will take a long time to go through all the different potential drugs that participants in the study could be on and can we allow that or not. And, uh, and the the list of contraindicated drugs for a lot of the cl clinical trials that we work on is so big, we can only post it online because the protocol will be this big. Mm -hmm. So we, we just put a link, go here, mm -hmm. for the clinical sites. And then they can do a search and see, see if the drugs are, are on the list or not. So again, 3A4 is the primary uh, um, isozyme metabolism in the drugs. And so drugs that induce uh, metabolism or speed it up or decrease the concentrations of the other drugs that are substrates. Some drugs inhibit or slow down the P450 enzyme system, and that'll result in an increase in the plasma concentrations uh, of the other drugs, which are substrates. Um, and so this can be, we, we've, we've got many decades really experience of working with drugs to intentionally manipulate the 3A4 system and um, to, to try to drive doses of both drugs, the inhibitor and the active drug. Um, so that sequinavir drug I'd mentioned before, that thing was originally dosed every eight hours. I think it was on an empty stomach. No, it was with food. But three times a day dosing. When we gave it that little bit of ritonavir, we got to once a day dosing. So a huge change um, in terms of the dosing intervals. And then there's phase two reactions, mostly glucuronidation, uh, sulfation, and acetylation. And there are some implications, although not clearly as many. Um, but glucuronidation, for example, is a pathway that can be also be inhibited or induced. Um, and uh, but generally, those interactions are, are nowhere near as uh, nowhere near the magnitude of what we would see with uh, uh, 3A4, for example. And then excretion is the elimination of the unchanged. Um, uh, drug or, or the metabolite uh, from the body. The drugs can be eliminated via the kidneys, lungs, saliva, sweat, breast milk, etc. Some of the studies, I guess technically we're involved with it, but we're not running the samples. Um, there's a, a, a class or two of antiretroviral drugs for HIV actually uh, accumulate in hair. Obviously, I would not be a good candidate. <laughs> but <laughs> that being said, uh, we, they can pull hair from patients instead of you know, drawing blood and with the proper processing and mass spec analysis, et cetera, uh, quantitate how much drug is actually in the hair. And it's gone to the point now where they can predict 
someone's therapeutic outcome because it's a really good a measure of long-term adherence mm -hmm. to the drug regimen. So if the hair levels are low, to some point, you say, all right, you've been taking about 60% of your doses. If it's where it should be, you say it's 100%. And that actually correlates with clinical outcomes uh, from studies. So I guess we could put hair on this list, but quite honestly, I don't think we want to go to the hair route <laughs> at this point. Do yeah. you use your hair? I do not think so. If someone tries to pull this out, forget it. <laughs> Ain't gonna happen. Um, and then enterohepatic circulation also occurs, probably occurs more than most people think, um, but drugs excreted in the bile, stored and released from the gallbladder, and then transits to the small intestine where it's, uh, where it's reabsorbed. So if you ever see a concentration time curve, so here's a concentration y-axis time on the x-axis with a double peak, oftentimes that could be a reflective of all enterohepatic recirculation uh, of the drug. Not always, uh, but, but sometimes. In this case, this drug is called amprenivir, uh, is known to have a, a enteropathic recirculation. And uh, uh, colleagues of mine uh, did this modeling work uh, on it. So it's, it provides a really good example of what a concentration time curve would look like for enteropathic recirculation. And then renal clearance. Um, we don't do a lot of this. We could. Um, obviously, you need to have a assays to measure drugs in urine. Uh, we have some of those, but for most of the work that we do, uh, we, don't, we don't deal with that this too much. But renal clearance can be calculated to investigate uh, the mechanism of drug excretion. So in general, normal renal clearance is about 120 mils per minute. Uh, if that's what you get, then you're looking at glomerular filtration really only as the mechanism of, of renal uh, clearance of the drug. If it's less than 120, it's going to be uh, glomerular filtration and tubular reabsorption of the drug. And if it's greater than 120, it'll be uh, glomerular filtration and tubular secretion of the drug. So you get an idea. And uh, both the tubular reabsorption and tubular secretion in the uh, uh, renal tubules are processes that can also be blocked. Uh, they can be inhibited. And so, and they can cause significant drug-drug interactions through that pathway, which is completely separate of, of the liver. And then total clearance, the measure of the ability of the body uh, to eliminate the drug. It is not an indicator of how much drug is removed, but of the volume of plasma that is cleared of drug in a given period of time. So clearance is most often expressed as a unit volume per unit time, mils per minute, liters per hour is typically what, what I would use. Um, total clearance is renal liver plus other and then the half-life of the drug is the time for the plasma concentration to re be reduced by 50 percent um, so five half-lives so after starting a drug dosing regimen before full effects will be seen which would be steady state uh, for a drug to be eliminated from the body so it takes five half-lives to reach steady state so if a drug has a 24-hour half-life it's going to take at least five days of dosing before steady state is reached. Um, and, um, and it will also take five days for the drug to be essentially completely eliminated from the body, which is why for, um, I just know this, I know personally going through this, um, when insurance people visit you and want to measure your urine for smoking or nicotine use, what they're looking for in the urine is the primary metabolite of nicotine called cotinin. And uh, cotinin, nicotine itself has a very short half-life, only a few hours at best. But the cotinin, which is renally, renally eliminated, has a half-life of 24 hours. And so it would take close to a week, five days, um, for that to be completely eliminated. And so that's, that's one of the reasons why we look at the cotinin, is it has a much longer half-life and it's measurable. Yeah. When you say completely eliminated, you mean gone from the body or below the level of detection? Uh, gone from the body. Um, well, actually, I guess technically it'd be both. Depends on what the limit of detection is of the assay method. Kevin developed it, you can find it all the way down to you know, 10 to the minus 10th. I'm just kidding. We, we try to have low limits of detections uh, if we can uh, in our group. But yeah, five half half-lives is essentially 98% of the drug is gone. So there's Theoretically, there's still some there. Um, whether it's measurable or not depends on the drug and the acid. 
Uh, but yeah, so, so important point, five half-lives to reach steady state, and five half-lives for the drug to be essentially completely eliminated from the body. So an application to drug development, so preclinical and clinical studies uh, that are done, we, we work a lot uh, in this uh, realm. Um, conducting the single ascending dose, SAD and MAD, and multiple ascending dose studies using, using an adequate uh, dosing range. I very often see, in particular, uh, well, clinically as well, but uh, more basic science researchers, particularly working with animal models, are doing a dose ranging study, and they would use placebo, 10 milligrams and 20 milligrams. <laughs> That's not what you want to do. <laughs> uh, it needs to be a big range, really big range, if you're going to see no effect and maximum effect and something in the middle. And so the minimum to me is three dose, three different doses over at least a tenfold range, preferably higher. I like 20, 25, 30. Um, and when we do this in humans as well. Um, use an adequate sample size, collect the samples over an appropriate time frame. This depends again on the half-life. If the half-life is an hour, you probably don't need to sample out for a week. The mm -hmm. drug won't be there. Um, and then look at the concentration response relationships. Instead of simply dosing until there's some maximum, uh, maximum tolerated dose and a toxicity occurs, I'm not a fan of that approach. I think we look at the, the concentrations and, or the doses uh, relative to the response to treatment and to figure out the, the optimal concentrations that's needed. So one of the reasons for doing the, the single ascending dose studies is to look at the linearity of the drug. So this is an example of a drug where it was, I think it was 50 milligrams up to 1400 milligrams in a single, uh, single ascending PK study. Relatively linear through this portion, and then the higher dose and boom, AEC dropped off. Anybody know what this would be called? Okay, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Capacity limited absorption. So what's happening here is the body just can't handle that volume of drug being input. And so it's not being absorbed on a linear fashion. The absorption uh, capacity is maxed out uh, at roughly at this thousand milligram dose. And so this is important stuff to see. Contrary, let's say instead of this point being right here, was way up here, up by the ceiling. That would be nonlinear, big time. And so this is what, one of the reasons why these types of studies are done. If there's nonlinearity, so you increase the dose, 50 milligrams, you get an AUC of 25. 100 milligrams, you should get an AUC of 50, right? But at 100 milligrams, you get an AUC of 300. Now you're getting into rapid toxicity territory that needs to be avoided. Oftentimes, drugs that exhibit that, especially to a serious degree, that's it, They'll, that drug will be done because they don't want to get into that whole area. They'd rather have a drug that's relatively linear uh, across a wide range of doses from a safety perspective. So how are the pharmacokinetics of the drug determined? Well, I just punched the numbers into a really nice software program. They come right out, but I do do that. But um, you also kind of need to understand what you're inputting and what the results look like. Um, so some of the sample collection strategies, we typically will deal with plasma. <laughs> Um, although we've, at a lab, we've done a lot of other stuff, tissues, um, uh, serum, spinal fluid, biopsies. Uh, we also look at intensive sampling versus sparse sampling. So intensive would be a patient comes in or a participant comes in, give them the dose. We draw multiple samples, you know, from a Heplock or something over a 24-hour period of time. That would be intensive. The sparse is that same person would come in and we only draw one or maybe two and then they can go home. The difference with the sparse is you just need a lot more people to make up the data. Um, and it's really more for modeling, population pharmacokinetic modeling approach as opposed to intensive where we can use non-compartmental effect and I'll show you in a minute here. And then there's also non-invasive uh, non ways uh, to measure, to, to collect the specimen. And most of, but most analytical methods are, divide, are designed for plasma uh, analysis. The ways of looking at these, um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but typically it's going to be HPLC or UPLC um, uh, on the front end, and then the drug is quantitated using mass spectrometry. 
Mass Spec is, is fantastic, very sensitive, very selective, very specific uh, it's in its ability to identify the analytes, whatever it is that you're looking for. It's very useful for small volumes. We do a lot of babies and premature baby type studies. You can't get five mils of blood, there's no way. Um, so we're looking at collecting 0.2 mils of whole blood, which would be slightly under 100 microliters of plasma. And with that 100 microliters of plasma, for some of our better assays, we could still run that three, four, five times if we needed to, to get the result. That's how much uh, extra plasma we would have. In fact, the sites usually don't like to go less than 0.25 or 0.2 mils because it's so hard to measure. <laughs> Those little scoop tubes. Disadvantage, outrageously expensive. Uh, outrageously expensive. Um, and they are difficult to run and to maintain. It takes a very special group of individuals that know how to run these instruments and, and figure out what's going on with them, when they break, et cetera. Um, they're, they're very, very expensive to maintain uh, as well. So this is a typical uh, concentration time profile where we have the drug generic drug concentration on the y-axis and time post-dose. This would be a 24-hour dosing interval, for example. Drug is administered, see this right here, slight lag time in absorption. Takes a little while for the drug to get into the system. Oral administration goes up, reaches a peak, and then the drug is eliminated. Obviously, this is the absorption uh, phase. Over here is the elimination phase where we calculate the half-life from. And then for some drugs, like the ones I work with, um, the trough concentration, which is the, the last concentration before the next dose is to be given. Um, is a critical component uh, in, in antiviral therapeutics to prevent resistance uh, of that drug. In terms of calculating the AUC, I'm not gonna quiz you on any of this, just wanted to let you know, it's really pretty simple. You have your concentration time curve. It's simply divided up into areas, area one, two, three, four, five, six, all the way out. The, each of these areas are uh, calculated, determined using these simple little formulas and then you add them all up. And in this case, we'd have an AUC from zero to eight hours. And that's the area of the curve for the drug. Um, once you have that, and you know the dose, hopefully, um, and the area of the curve, almost all these other parameters on this list of useful equations you can take home with you, um, <laughs> can be derived. And so it's really pretty easy. So you can get, you know the dose, you know the area of the curve, you can calculate the clearance of the drug. You know the clearance, you know the half-life, you can calculate the distribution volume of the drug, uh, et cetera. Um, if you know the AUC um, from IV versus oral dosing, you can calculate the bioavailability uh, of the drug. And so um, it's really just a, a pretty powerful calculator for the most part. Um, but you, you still kind of have to know what, what everything means. Um, so these are some of the equations. So lastly, I just wanted to touch on um, some of the, the other way to analyze everything we've been talking about this, this, this not, was not, is non-compartmental analysis, or NCA, um, where you derive the different areas, add them up, get the area of the curve, et cetera. Um, very useful. Uh, you can really only use an intensive pharmacokinetic sampling strategy uh, for that type of analysis. Population or, or pharmacokinetic modeling expands tremendously uh, what you can do. Um, describe the data, quantify processes, explore mechanisms, and most importantly, me is making predictions or using simulations. Um, so you can get the standard parameters that you could from a non-compartmental, but you can also assess, this is, brings up the question earlier, assess covariate effects of age, weight, uh, creatinine clearance, et cetera. Do any of those influence the clearance of the drug? If so, you know, you test for it and, and account for it. You can uh, describe the absorption characteristics. What does the drug absorption look like, you know, with food and without food? And you quantify that process. Uh, look at uh, exploring the metabolic uh, uh, formation rate constants. Um, I'll try to touch on a point on that in a minute here. And then more importantly, simulate concentrations to predict effects. So if this concentration produces this effect, this concentration produces this effect, and you know all of this, all of this can go to the model. You can simulate with any dose you want. Uh, whatever concentrations you want, and what that effect, uh, predict what that effect would be, whether it's a beneficial or a toxic effect, and then directly link the pharmacokinetic model with, with the response is, is, is some of the philosophies for the modeling. 
in general, there's really a couple of types of overall models, the one and two compartment model. One compartment model is drug simply goes in to the body and essentially instantaneously it's, it's all over. It's, it's homogeneously distributed uh, throughout the body. Uh, that's how the graph mathematically this is how it would look drug in distribution volume and drug out and the curve would look like this you see a nice strap flat straight line uh, during the elimination phase and that indicates really a more of a one compartment model as opposed to a two compartment where drug goes in and then immediately after uh, administration uh, it focuses on certain areas in the body it might be lungs heart kidney, brain, wherever, uh, it focuses on those first and then it's equally uh, distributed throughout the body. Graphically, this is what it would look like. There would be two phases. This first distribution phase right here and then a secondary uh, terminal elimination phase. And so if you look at the, the concentration time profile of the drug and there's going to be some modeling done uh, with the data, that's gonna be really important to understand if you're dealing with a one or two compartment uh, model. And, and uh, mathematically, this is simply what it looks like. You have a central volume and a peripheral uh, distribution volume. It's really the biggest difference. So this is an example of that. Also, Tamivir is Tamiflu. So a while back, uh, we had been working on this drug for quite a, quite a while. Um, some of you may re recall Oseltamivir is the Oseltamivir phosphate, the parent drug. The active component of Tamiflu is Oseltamivir carboxylate. So it's actually uh, hepatically converted, uh, primarily in the liver, uh, to the carboxylate form. The parent drug is a two-compartment disposition drug. The uh, active drug, the carboxylate, is simply a one-compartment. Um, and so we put all this together uh, from some, uh, this is all from uh, zero to two-year-old babies uh, with confirmed influenza receiving uh, Tamiflu, Oseltamivir. And this is the, uh, the, con the concentration time curve for the parent, and this is the concentration time curve for the, uh, the carboxylate. And these are just some uh, goodness of fifth prediction models um, to see if you're doing okay uh, or not. In this case, it was, it was actually pretty good. But this drug um, had a very long conversion from the parent to the metabolite that I just couldn't figure out. Some babies, it was really short. It was very quick. You, you'd see the, the parent drug, and then boom, there's the, the carboxylate. In others, there would be up to a two-hour delay. And for, honestly, four to six months, I couldn't figure out why there was this difference. And then I sat down and linked, modeled the absorption characteristics, the, the, the metabolite formation rate, basically. And there was clearly one group that was quick, and another group that was really slow. So I, the group that was slow had a much smaller sample size. So I grabbed those first, went back, and looked up, and all of those babies were the youngest ones that were being fed very frequently. Mm -hmm. And so we were able to incorporate the, the, the fo food, no food thing into the model to describe the, the formation rate of the uh, active metabolite. Um, so that's one of the reasons, again, why modeling can be uh, very useful. And then lastly, I want to wrap up with um, what I consider to be an ideal uh, uh, PKPD study. This is a drug called Dolutegravir, it's an antiretroviral made by GSK and Vive. We've actually been working with it for a long time on the pediatric side. These are all adult data. But this is their phase two study where they had a placebo group right here in the orange line and then a two milligram, a 10 milligram, and a 50 milligram dose groups, and I think it's N of eight uh, in each one. And what they were measuring is that simply the change in the virus, you can measure how much virus is circulating in the body, change in the amount of virus from day zero through day 10, when they were only on that one drug. And if you notice this range here, two to 50 milligrams, this 25X range. So very nice, uh, very nicely done. And they're able to discern a really nice difference between all three of these doses in terms of response. And that's, that's really what you're looking for. And you're not going to see that unless you have a wide range of doses that are being used. And this is where uh, uh, it led. This is the, the pharmacokinetic data, so the concentration time data for the 2, the 10, and the 50 milligrams. Very simple, one compartmental looking uh, drug. 
But over here is uh, the exposure response. And so uh, I'll try to walk through this real quick. Uh, this is the trough concentration. I mentioned that before, the final concentration before the next dose is administered. In this case, it's a 24 hour trough concentration. And this is just a change in the viral load from baseline through day 10. And here's the two milligram dose group. Here's the 10 milligram dose group, and here's the 50 milligram dose group. And so using this, this is the, a maximum factor Emax model, can fit a best fit line through those data points. And again, this is why, if you imagine for a second, this two milligram group is not there, all you're gonna have is really a straight line. So if the, if the other dose was 20 milligrams instead of two, everything would be right on a straight line and you would not be able to determine the clinically important parameter of the EC50, EC90, or EC95, concentration required to produce 95% of the maximum response. And this red line going across, uh, the Emax is about 2.6 so 2 log drop uh, in the viral load. So, so of all the antiretrovirals that we've had to date, that's the, the most potent by far. Um, and, I mean, there's no wonder this drug is used a lot um, you know, in the real world. But what we're able to do from this is determine right about here at this dotted line, the, uh, the EC90 for the drug, 300 nanograms per mil, period. And so that's the number, the magic number. So I get calls, emails all the time said, yeah, Ed, you know, patients on this dog, you tell your beer, um, now, he or she is taking drug X, and that's going to reduce the dietary concentrations by 40%. Say, so what? Doesn't matter. Because the dose that got approved was this 50 milligram dose. So you can, you can get up to close to an 80% reduction in the troughs, and clinically it's still okay. Um, and so what that 300 is the, tar is the key number. We've been dealing with the FDA recently about this as well. And, but it's really critical to find this out early in the development process. So I, you know, for me, total kudos to these guys for, for doing it the right way because now we've brought that drug in the pediatric population. And without that number, how in the heck do you figure out what the dose should be in babies? You can do it, but it doesn't mean it's right. Uh, and so this tells us you know, exactly the direction to go. So the relevance of these early phase uh, PKPD studies ensure proper dose selection during early phase development and quickly make go or no-go decisions. So let's say the, that trough concentration is right around here. Everybody started developing atrial fibrillations. Well, <laughs> either the drug is over or you go back to a much lower dose to avoid concentrations up there. Um, but let's say these concentrations were needed for the maximum response and it caused a fib. Drugs, it's done. Can it move on to the next one and save all the costs from the further phase two and phase three and phase four studies. Evaluate the clinical significance of drug-drug interactions like what I just mentioned. Um, concentrations are dropped by a certain percent. In general, you can say it doesn't really matter because they're still gonna be okay. Uh, explore alternative dosing <coughs> schedules. So with this drug, is the half-life long enough? Can we go to every other day dosing, for example? We can't, but it's something you can look at now that you know what that target uh, concentration is. And most importantly is bringing a new drug in, bringing a drug into the pediatric population because you're gonna introduce new formulations of the drug that will have invariably different concentration time profiles. It will look different. Um, and so, if you're targeting adult exposures, which is what most people would do, and you've got this new formulation that's never been really studied in adults, uh, it becomes really difficult to try to uh, uh, match the two to come up with the appropriate dosing, dose and dosing schedule. And so that's one of the things that we, have to, we deal with quite frequently is figuring out how to dose uh, one of these drugs in, in pediatrics. Uh, but having the target concentration is extremely critical to be able to do that. And this is all clinical, but this is also for completely relevant for animal studies as well. And if you're doing animal work and you're trying to figure out the best dose to produce X, <clears throat> don't limit yourself to a tight range of dosing or tight range of exposures. Make it broad. They're just mice. It'll be, it'll be okay. And make it broad. 
Um, because if this hadn't been done, this hadn't been done, when it got done, it will never, ever get done mm -hmm. clinically. And that is a promise. I've never, ever seen a drug where, they have, where they've done a really poor job in terms of developing the concentration or dose response relationships. Never found one. You know there's one there, but they never found it. And now there, it's years and years and years later, and there's no way you can go back and do this type of a study once the drug is approved. Absolutely impossible. So if it's going to be done, it needs to be done early, generally in phase two, uh, could be one, if it, especially for oncology. But um, uh, just very important information. So just to wrap up, so understanding the basic principles of pharmacokinetics can assist in the drug discovery and development process. Um, a lot of different facets to doing all of this, but proper collection of the data uh, in animal studies can provide useful insight to, to the admin uh, uh, in humans as well. Um, and then establishing the concentration response relationships is critical for the proper dose uh, selection. Well, again, whether it's animals, uh, animal models, or humans. So I will, I have no idea what time it is, but I'll try to wrap it up there. Mm -hmm. And if you guys have any questions, I'd be more than happy to. Uh, <coughs> Oh. <laughs> okay, thank you. Okay. Question. Yeah. On the back two slides where you're showing the ideal concentration of your efficacy, mm -hmm. is, and you're saying that should only be done, is that even more prevalent in newer studies that we're doing it, or is it still an issue? It, it's to me it's still an issue and it depends on the company. Uh, I would hope if we're an academically licensed drug, mm -hmm. it would be done properly. Um, there are some companies that they have old-timey clinical pharmacologists and they're dead set on doing things their way and they won't do this. This happened to be from a younger group of clinical pharmacologists and uh, we had talked about it and I was like, man, if you do this, that'd be fantastic. Well, even if it doesn't work out, at least you tried. Um, and so, uh, in general, I think people understand it. They just don't grasp how much doing this early on can save them later. I mean, it's just logical to have that kind of information. Well, yeah, to people with three brain cells, it is. Um, <laughs> sorry. <clears throat> but yeah, I, I just, they're used to doing things a certain way and they just, they won't change. And so this isn't new stuff. I mean, this, this has been around for a long time. It's just, doing it clinically, applying it, and then seeing how it really matters later on. Uh, a lot of people just haven't had that experience yet. And can you uh, comment a little bit on the, um, you have an exposure versus response, but the response in the case of antivirals is easy to measure for all those. But let's say you have tumor growth. Mm -hmm. how, how are you gonna correlate that and is that kind of biomarkers, I guess, come in? And that's so waiting the, for three months for your tumors. It's, it's, it's exactly where the biomarkers come in. HIV, we have a very good biomarker with the plasma viral load. Tumor growth, size of tumors can be measured. Percent change from day one to day whatever. Pharmacokinetics of the drug are known in that individual. The What happened to that tumor is known in that individual. A bunch of the individuals are put together on a slide like that, and you look at the response. Blood pressure, very easy to get. Uh, ideal way to look at concentration or dose response relationships. Um, what are some other markers? Um, uh, Cholesterol level, I guess. Yeah, yeah, and that's been shown with, with uh, Lipitor mm -hmm. in the past as well, the dose response relationship. Uh, so, so whatever biomarkers related to that particular disease state, whether it's in animals or in humans. Um, and, and that's really one of the keys is sometimes there isn't a good biomarker. And, uh, and sometimes uh, clinicians and researchers might think there is, but they're just not quite sure if this is the right one to look at or not. Um, and so I think uh, CF is probably a good, you know, is it? Yeah. And so we've been working with some folks here with CF as well. And, um, and that it's an issue, mm -hmm. the actual biomarker component. But yeah, so if there's a decent biomarker and you design, design the study properly, this is the type of critical information that you can get from it. Mm -hmm. And boom, the rest of it, the rest of it's set basically. 
whether you know just target your dose to produce the troughs that you want go forward the fda loved this they loved it and um and so drug got approved in fact this was the first antiretroviral drug and i'm not here to promote the drug we've just been working with it forever um but it's the first antiretroviral to uh, receive its initial adult approval and a pediatric indication at the same time. And we, we did pediatric work here uh, for that at, uh, here at UAB. And uh, it's just an extremely useful um, uh, drug. Um, and so I just wish more uh, companies uh, drug with this class. This is an integrase inhibitor. There's plenty of other classes of antiretrovirals and other antivirals in general. Um, it would just be nice to see other people at least try to do this. If it doesn't work, then it doesn't work. But um, if it does, it's really going to help the entire rest of the development process. Any more questions? If not, thanks right. again. Thank you. Appreciate it. It's a few minutes before one.